All right, let's wait for this update. By the way, as soon as it's live, it starts recording to YouTube. So this is where you like have to give like a really cool intro, which I just did. Which you just did. <laughs> Mike the celebrity. I watch more of the replays than I actually have been on the live ones lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Uh, we're just getting started over here with the planetary imaging processing the techniques here. And there will be lots of typing while we're trying to share this out here right now. So I appreciate you guys being patient with us as I'm sharing it. And putting this on the event page until we figure out how to embed that into the event. My name is Scott Lewis, and with us today we have Ahmed Kale, who's in Turkey. Yes. Hello. We have Chris Ridgway, who is in Indiana, USA. Mike Phillips, who is in North Carolina, USA. Yes. And I, I'll try not to slide your name, Peter. It's Peter Malinsky. Yes, that's, that's correct. All right, and you're in Poland, correct? Yes. Wonderful. So we obviously we have a great global hangout uh, this afternoon, early morning, evening, depending on where in the world you are. So still just getting everything out here. If, um, if you guys want to go ahead and just introduce yourselves a little more about what you guys do and what we'll be going over today as I'm trying to spread the word. Well, Ahmed, why don't you tell us why you started this this idea? This was a good idea you had here to kind of bring everybody together and talk about yeah. how we make these images. Yes, you, actually, you, you started this. Yes, uh, but actually, actually uh, I think Mike Mitchell or Mike Rector uh, or uh, or Paul maybe uh, asked me to uh, to explain my uh, my techniques. Uh, so. So we were thinking to uh, make a the hangout uh, with with us, with some people. Uh, but uh, after I create an create the event, uh, so people uh, join it and it become public. You know. Uh, so we didn't think it it would be a hangout on air. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's now it's broadcasting. Yes. Well, there's a there's a really big uh, response to the, the the magic behind the scenes and how you guys come out with your amazing images. And mm. it's not as easy as just taking a photo and letting it go. There's a there's a lot that goes on. Yeah. And yeah. I I think there will be a lot of people really interested in in just how much work goes on besides just setting up a telescope connecting a camera and just letting it fly. And I think it'll be um, really informative, but also it's it's something that there's a lot of open software out there that everybody could actually do this with some basic open source software and come out with some beautiful images. Mm -hmm. So what got you into astro imaging, Chris? Oh, sorry, you had me mute. I had myself muted there. I was trying to type this out. Um, well, just uh, I've had the uh, I've always wanted to you know, have beautiful images that you see on the internet, and uh, decided to go ahead and invest in a nice telescope and uh, imaging setup. Um, just tried to go through it myself. I've I've read a lot of uh, uh, posts on forums, uh, things like that, where you know a lot of people were telling me that. You know, it, it almost seemed like they, they were telling you you had to have thousands and thousands of dollars to do this. And I wanted to see if I could do it, you know, with a modest budget. And uh, so far, I've been pretty happy with it. It's been great fun. How about you, Mike? We'll get you in up. So I got a telescope for the Mars opposition in 2005-2006. I got a nice 8-inch Schmidt cast grain, a little bit smaller than Ominous. And I started looking through the eyepiece 
a night overnight. It never looked the same as it did in comparable size telescopes that I would see photos of online. And I said, something's not right here. And I figured some things out along the way. Collimation is important. That one it kind of thwarted me for a little while. And the weather had a large impact on what you could and couldn't see. But I think at the end of the day, I realized that people taking images had an advantage because the camera had much more sensitivity than your eyes. And I said, okay, so I'm, I'm going to try this with a camera. And so I, you know, I went the same way Chris did, and I said, let me see if I can use this little webcam. And I stuck a webcam in it, and, and it just kind of spiraled out of control from there. You know, you'd be like, okay, maybe I'll get a more sensitive camera, or maybe I'll get, you know, color filters for it and a monochrome camera. And it just kind of sucks you in and drives your wallet out. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is addictive and, and costly. Yeah. How about you, Peter? How long have you been doing astronomy and imaging? Well, I'm imaging about, um, about three years. And I started by looking on the planets from my balcony. I've seen very bright stars, and I wondered how can I look on them, see anything bigger. They went on the web, looked on the telescopes. Next, I found the pictures, and I wanted to take the same pictures as those on the web, so I got a telescope, then a camera, and it got, got me imaging the plants for about three years from now. Very nice. And Stuart, our Hello. recent addition, how you doing? Good, can you hear me? I can. I'm okay. doing really well. All right, good. Uh, what Hi. got you into astronomy and astroimaging? Um, I got into astroimaging because I had a fit of insanity. Because uh, it is, I did, had no idea how, how time sucking and how much uh, fun but expensive this hobby would be. Um, I'd been into astronomy for a really long time, um, you know, for 20 years. And then about five years ago, uh, I, I decided to upgrade my telescope, and I, I did that, and I stuck a camera on it, and it's been, uh, it's, that's, that's how, it's been ever since I've been doing that. Well, that's awesome. So, as, now that we've uh, spread the word out there, and I'm starting to get comments rolled in, I see uh, Tom Higgins has made a quick question for the newbies. And the saying here, you know, what is a better low cost of baseline setups for building, you know, astronomy for telescopes? And he's got his two youngest watching at home. So as we're going to be um, going into the actual telescopes themselves and hooking up the cameras, is there anything that you guys recommend for setting up, uh, getting a, a budget but also effective telescope for astroimaging? Well, I actually just posted a comment on there, so I'll go ahead and chime in. I started out with a, uh, a small, unguided uh, reflector, Newtonian reflector from Celestron, and uh, purchased the uh, webcam for a computer, and I've got less than $200 set up in that uh, small setup. It's not, you know, anything like what we all have here today, but, uh, you know, you can get decent images out of it. Uh, like I said, for under $200 in that setup. So I mean, you can start out pretty reasonably, uh, you know, and then just work your way up. Very good. So with the, the, the first thing that we do with any sort of astronomy imaging, we obviously we have our telescope and we have our camera. And I believe uh, Ahmed and Peter will be showing us initially how to set up the DSLR to the telescope itself. So take it away, Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have also the uh, Philips camera. You know, it's the cheapest, I think, the cheapest and uh, uh, the most uh, effective, maybe, in the, in the, uh, in the cheapest uh, area. Uh, I started uh, capturing image with this, and then uh, I bought a DSLR camera here. It's the T2i. It's a, a modified camera actually. It's, it's for uh, deep sky imaging. Imaging. And now I'm going to show you how to uh, attach this camera to the t 
telescope. Okay. And first, we have some equipment like say T ring. Okay. We use this for attaching uh, camera to the telescope. Just uh, remove the lens. Okay. And the T ring is attached here. Okay. And there is also uh, another equipment called T adapter. Okay. I have uh, for 1.25 inch, and there is also 2 inch adapter. Okay. Yes. Just attach the T adapter to the T ring. Now it's ready to attach to the camera, to the telescope. So, so let me show you how to attach it. Just remove uh, your diagonal and uh, put it back of your telescope like this. And it's ready. Just uh, connect your camera to the, your PC and now you are ready to capture your planetary image. Of course you have to uh, uh, align your telescope and sleeve, sleeve to the target. Okay? And there is also, like I said, there is two inch opti options. Just remove this T adapter. Here. And you have two inch adapter. Now is that for different telescopes? No, you can use the same telescope. Right. But uh, in the uh, if you you are taking a large field of view, okay, the uh, 1.25 is small. So you get some vignetting, vignetting uh, around the image, the corner of the image. So to get rid of this, you should use a larger uh, adapter. Okay. This one also directly connects to the back of your telescope. Here, this, there is a SGT thread here. Just remove your visual back. This is visual back. And this adapter also directly connects to the back of the telescope without uh, without this piece. I use this because uh, I also get some vignetting with, with the two inch uh, adapter. So uh, if you uh, if you close your camera to the telescope, so you, the vignetting will be re re reduced. Okay. So I I use sometimes with this and sometimes directly connect but uh, when you uh, connect the closer to the uh, telescope your camera there is also another effect becomes it's called spherical aberration 
So it depends on your, your choice. If you don't like the spherical aberration, you may use this one with this one. Okay, and uh, taking flat image, you can uh, remove the uh, vignetting effects. And, and I believe that we're going to go into what the vignetting is later on, correct? When we're going through the actual image processing. Uh, take with flat image. Uh, you can uh, you can remove the uh, effect. Oh. Now, how about you, Peter? Do you need do you do anything different with your telescope and hooking up with the camera? Well, I have a mono DMK camera. This is very popular for planetary imaging. And I have also a filter wheel for it. So I have to connect everything together. Here I have 2 inch focuser. 2 inch focusers are very popular. So you need a 2 inch nose piece to move put something in the focuser. Screw it, and that will hold. Filter wheels will ha usually have a 125 inch in a eyepiece holder, or when you c where you can put an eyepiece. Then I can look for a planet, center it in the eyepiece, which see a lot of the sky, and when it's centered, I remove the eyepiece and come out and put the camera in and that's the basic setup for imaging and sometimes I also put a barrel lens between the camera and the wheel everything has a 125 inch nose pieces or so the camera goes to the barrel and that goes to the future wheel and that's the standard setup for such an imaging. Very good. Can you explain what a Barlow is for the, the people that don't really know what a Barlow lens is? A Barlow lens is uh, a piece of uh, optical element glass that will uh, enlarge the image scale. It will, uh, this one will double the magnification you could get with an eyepiece and will, will, will do the similar thing with the camera. It will make the image two times uh, bigger. With most of the telescopes, you need a barrel lens to get uh, close to the telescope maximum resol resolving powers. What's the, uh, the, the limit at which it can, it can show a really big image of the plant without destroying it. Very good. Now, I, I know, Stuart, you use a refracting telescope. Do you do anything different with the refractor as opposed to the reflectors? Um, a little bit, but can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, in terms of the refractor, um, the image will be flipped compared to the uh, the reflector because um, the reflector, especially if you're using a diagonal, um, will have a, a, a 180 degree flip. But in but in the uh, in in reality, I hook it up exactly the same way uh, that Ahmed does, and I have a if I'm doing planetary imaging, I use my my camera, which is a, this is an imaging source uh, webcam uh, that uh, takes uh, pretty good planetary uh, images. Um, and if I'm doing deep sky images, I uh, also use my DSLR. And there's one thing that I'd like to mention in terms of planetary imaging. Uh, one is it's really hard to get uh, the thing in view and so it's really nice to use a flip mirror and a flip mirror is a device where it's got a you stick it on the back of the scope I can go down and get it I forgot to bring it up you stick it on the back of the scope and then uh, you stick an eyepiece and when you look in the eyepiece you can center it and then you flip it down and it'll automatically be in view right in the um, right in the field of view. And then the next issue is focusing, which can be a little tough. 
Uh, there's various different ways that you can you can focus on in programs that will you do it. I use this, which is a, called a Botanoff mask, and what this does it creates a diffraction grading uh, in your view, and with diffraction grading you can get really precise focus without having to resort to computer programs, um, and I find that the focusing with my Botanoff mask is perfectly adequate. Awesome. So obviously, as we're, as we're hooking everything up, we have your camera, your telescope, and just using USB or FireWire. So it's going to be placed through the laptop or computer there to be pulling images. And a lot of times, they'll be doing it in an AVI file. Is that correct? Is that the best that you guys use for processing? Yeah, yes, I use an AVI file, and it's important that when you're doing an AVI file that you don't frame capture too high, because if you frame capture too high, it's going to have compression. So you do a frame capture that's relatively low, uh, so you can get the full data out of each image. So it's about five to ten frames per second, or what would be optimal? Um, I, I use I use 15. I don't know what you use, Mike. Well, I was gonna. I was actually gonna disagree with you a little bit on that one, right? And I think part of the challenge is, in most cases, that you end up with with a rate that's too high. So I can image, let's say, 30, and you might image at 15, but you know, certain computers won't be able to keep up with that data rate. You know, every time you record th uh, 30 frames a second, you know, over 60, 90 seconds, you might not get all of those frames. You might lose some of them. Uh, and there's some, there's some tricks that you can use to get around that. But I think one of the ideas is that at a higher frame rate, you tend to take a faster snapshot of, of whatever turbulence or atmospheric issues you might have, what usually is called seeing, right? So we usually call it seeing. The higher frame rates will tend to freeze the seeing a lot better, even if it's kind of iffy. Right? Well, let, let me... Um uh, let me just say what I'm, what I meant by the, you still do the frame rate, but you can still do the shutter speed fast. So if I'll do a frame rate of one at one, you know, 15 per second, right. I'll still do still do a shutter speed of, you know, one to 30th or one to 60th. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still doing the fast shutter speed, but I'm just I'm just not um, uh, I'm just not capturing it like 60 frames per second. Writing, That's what yeah, I mean. you're not writing this one. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, because that that is so. Yeah, the higher frame rate is good. Um, but more so to your point, the higher shutter speed is good because it tends to freeze the scene a lot. The higher frame rate gives you more frames to work with, which has a downside too because now you have to have large disks and it takes longer to process. You know? So if you're sometimes I'll capture. Now I'm, I'm in extreme, so don't follow me if you're just getting started. But in some instances, I'll, I'll capture 90 or 100 frames a second, and I'll capture almost all of them uh, because I'll use a RAM disk and all sorts of other weird things. Uh, but you end up with gigabytes and gigabytes of data, and I'll take more upon more upon more upon more. So I'm a little excessive when it comes to that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'd rather have the top thousand or two thousand frames and throw away nine or ten thousand of them. I just get rid of them because I don't want them. Right? I, you use a computer program that we'll see later to to find the best quality frames and get rid of the, the worst quality frames. Yeah, we've seen your telescope. We know you're excessive. That's yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Mike, Mike, what camera are you using? So right now, for the past couple of years, I've been using for my planetary work the Point Grey Research Flea 3, which is a FireWire 800 camera, and it's a monochrome. Um, so the other thing, too, for, for planetary work, since this is a planetary hangout, I know I might use this as a digital SLR, but you don't need the wide field of view for planetary work. So uh, almost exclusively between the image source and the Point Grey cameras, my cameras have been 640 by 480, which has been good enough for you know, even the largest planet, which is Jupiter. Uh, you don't need a, a higher resolution camera for planetary work, even though it might seem like you would want that. You don't need that. A 640 by 480 is fine. And also the higher resolution cameras, they're slower, because you have to capture you know, a huge field of view, a huge frame, when you don't need all that data. Exactly. Because yeah. it's going to be all black. Yeah, so, some of that comes down to, if you want the, the, the real uh, factual piece of it is really the actual pixel size in microns becomes important because the telescope has a certain uh, re resolving power and then the, the pixels translate to how you resolve that detail. So pixel size is probably more important than the actual resolution of the camera. 
Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for going over your actual hardware that you guys go over. But the, the next step in the process is exactly how you're getting these amazing images from the camera and your scope. Scott throws. Scott. <laughs> he, knew, he knew this was coming, too. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm gonna go grab my while we're cutting. I'm gonna go grab my flip mirror just to show it. I'll be right back. Okay. I acquire all my networks. I'm probably not the best person to cover acquisition. Here you are, Scott. Here I am. Here back. I get, and I was going to be hosting this, but my internet's been going out, as you can you know, see. So don't wave <laughs> your arms around. You're causing too much motion. And well, hello. You know, I shouldn't have wore the stripes either, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I don't know if you guys heard me at all, but uh, as far as what process and what software do you guys use for grabbing the actual photos to the computer? Me first? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Doc. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have, you know, I have a DSLR camera, and there is a two way to capture uh, the uh, the video. Uh, there is a, a crop function. Of the, of the camera, okay. You can directly capture your image without any uh, other software uh, because it the camera has its own uh, capture feature, okay. Uh, the uh, the other way to capture your video with using some other program like uh, Backyard US. Uh, and there are also some other program, but I think Backyard US is the best one. So uh, let me show you how how to capture uh, your uh, your video uh, using the Backyard US. Okay. So first, I should connect my uh, camera to my laptop. And, and it looks like Chris has the actual software up on the screen if you want to switch over to him to be able to actually see the software. Can you see my de desktop? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Do you have it uh, in the Hangout? Do you have your window selected? Yes, I have selected my window. Okay. Okay. Here is the Backyard US. Uh, you uh, you co click the Connect button, and then it's connected. There is some uh, option. We use f uh, planetary uh, button for capturing. Okay. Those aren't planets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and. Uh, there are some options. You, you see, there's a 5x zoom function. Okay, if you press this one, it uses the uh, center of the sensor. It's a crop mode, so it's exactly one uh, one pixel in the picture, exactly in one picture of the sensor, right now. So it's uh, the resolution uh, sensor resolution is I think 4.3 micrometer. It's very small, and you get a uh, very large image with uh, with the uh, same uh, focal length with other uh, cameras. So it shows the bigger uh, image uh, when compared to other uh, camera. Uh, so there's some options you should select. You know. Uh, the shutter speed, the ISO speed also. There should be a aperture, you know, because we will uh, connect the camera directly to the telescope. 
So it's a prime focus. So you should just select the shutter speed. And I ISO value. The settings it depends on which planet you are capturing and which uh, focal length you are using. So uh, you just uh, change this value to to see a good uh, picture on the screen. You know you should uh, keep the uh, histogram um, maybe within uh, 200 or 220 or something like that not too uh, too much to over ex uh, to make over exposure because you may lo lose some data and don't make so, uh, much dimmer so you 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 couldn't get uh, uh, detail you know and there is a, uh, also image count which uh, how many uh, frames you, you're gonna capture you you should uh, enter the way uh, enter the value let's say three 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 thousand frames I should uh, I'm gonna capture and you can also give, give the target name here let's say Mars and when you press record it start recording and it's capture three three thousand uh, frames and stops and then the, you capture the next one uh, this is how I use this uh, program to capture my uh, my video uh, but I prefer uh, to capture with with my uh, cameras on uh, video uh, video program okay Mm -hmm. Let me show it. Just can you no, see well, me? You're pulling that up. I'm I'm getting a question as well, and it, I, it's something that we were also talking about earlier. But are there any Linux options for using um, EOS? I'm your Linux I'm guy. Sure. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't use my EOS because uh, I have one that I use for Deep Sky. I don't use it for Planetary, um, so I don't use that one in particular in Linux. Um, I have uh, the webcam style, and traditionally I've used a, a program called Coriander. Coriander is a FireWire application in Linux, and that that'll record uh, pretty high frame rates, allows you to do camera control, all that sort of stuff. It, it's missing the histogram functions in it. Um, but it, it, historically, as, as I've told Mitchell Duke before, I've never really been a slave to the histogram. You kind of get an eye for it after a while, you know, so maybe it's something you use initially to get used to your, your optics and your setup, but Coriander's been pretty good to me. If you don't have a FireWire camera in Linux, you can use another program called WX Astral Capture, I think. I don't know if that was in your pile of programs that you've had listed on them. Um, there are definitely acquisitions programs for Linux that you can use that will work fine. Awesome. Yeah, no. to further that question, they said uh, backyard EOS will only work on Windows 7, Vista, and XP 32 bit or 64 bit. Yeah, that's not to say you can't try it in line under Linux. Yeah, I was just about uh, to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I recently got um, comp ports are tricky in line. There's a way you can do it. And I posted something to the software forum on Cloud Ignites about that, but I got the. Uh, Celeste on with the next next remote. I got next remote working in in, in line under Linux. That's kind of cool. And for all you non-Linux geeks like us, um, <laughs> it wine is um, what it's was it wine is not an emulator. It's yeah, a like yeah. it's a layer in Linux that allows you to run some uh, Windows executables when running Linux. Now, what uh, what other software did you have up Akbet that you wanted to show off? Uh, you're muted. Mute, mute. So, <laughs> can you see me? Yes. I can see my. I can see me. <laughs> okay. I can see you too. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a problem. I think uh, I just show the black screen on my hangout window. But if you you can see, it's okay. 
So I I use the camera uh, cameras video function. Okay, there's a uh, settings video settings. You you select the video settings here. Okay, and there is some options here. I think you can see it. I hope. <laughs> Can you see it? It's a little blurry, but we can see what you're talking about. Okay. Um, just select the uh, ex movie exposure to manual. Okay. To uh, to make uh, the settings by hand. Okay. Then uh, there is some options. The resolution of the uh, of the capture settings, so you should uh, select it as six forty uh, six forty four eighty. Okay, it's a crop mode. It used the uh, center of the sensor to capture the image. Uh, so. You you also set the uh, exposure time and ISO, ISO settings. Okay. Actually, the, the camera's own software shows uh, brighter the image. I don't know why. The backyard US show a little dimmer with the same settings, but uh, it's uh, brighter in the camera. So I prefer to use. Uh, camera's own uh, capture function. It also can capture 60 per second, 60 uh, frame per second. Uh, but backyard, backyard US can capture at most 30 frame per second. So it can capture more than uh, frame, uh, and it's brighter. So I prefer to use the. Uh, the cameras on the uh, video uh, video function. Okay. All right. Well, I know that uh, Peter, you have a different type of camera that you use for planetary. Uh, what what's, what's going to be the difference from using a, a DSLR, which most of us are fairly familiar with, as opposed to using an actual is that a CCD that you've got there? Yes, it's a CCD in small camera, machine vision, used to use by industry and for planetary imaging. The difference between a DSLR would be that it has its own software. It has to be connected to a computer to work. The software I use is called Fire Capture. It's a free application for imaging. And also, if you buy a such camera, you can you get a software with it. It's called IC Capture AS, and it can also be used. They are very similar programs. And if you would have a webcam or similar cameras, you can use uh, an application that's called SharpCap. And all of those applications are very similar. You have the live view of what camera see at the moment. So you can focus. And also you can control the camera settings, exposure time, gain, and for example, frame rate. Uh, I don't have the application what now because I'm on Linux. I do everything on Windows for planet imaging. But, but the application is very simple to use. I turn it on, center the planet on the uh, camera preview, focus it, and set the settings so like exposure time. For Jupiter, which is bright, I usually have a short exposure for about 60 frames per second. For Saturn, 30 uh, frames per second. And I sometimes also change the gain. Usually it's maximum, but sometimes you can use uh, lower settings for better quality. And, uh, this, and then I press the record button, and I record a few thousand frames for every I, uh, AVI file. And I record a lot of those files because some of them, or most of them, will be will, tr will give very bad images later in the processing. So I collect so a lot of those AVIs, and then I hope some of them will give uh, nice images. Awesome! Thank you. 
And Stuart, do you use a similar camera as well? Yeah, I have um, pretty much the same camera. Mine's I don't I don't know, Peter. I's, your, yours is a color webcam. Mine's a color webcam, and um, uh, so they, that comes. That particular camera model comes both in color and monochrome. Um, I use mine in color. Uh, Mike Mike does his in monochrome, and then he uses a filter wheel. Um, it's a little easier to do it in color, uh, just because it's already integrated, um, and you don't have to take as many uh, as many frames. So one question here. I'm sorry to to jump in. Um, regarding compression, a lot of times with AVI, there's a, a codec that's that's put in there to uh, reduce the size of the the incoming file, or to be able to handle the data rate and I know for instance with some of the imaging I've done with uh, with planetary imaging I'd end up with kind of interlacing so there's these horizontal rows that go through the, uh, the frames as, as they come in. Any of the cameras that you're discussing here will they um, will they take raw video and then uh, just save it as an uncompressed AVI or is there is there some compression layer that's going on as the video is being shot? For webcams, you will have compression as, as they are designed it's to be mass-made, low, low, cheap uh, products. For uh, those typical planetary cameras, they are machine machine vision cameras designed for industry. They output non-compressed uh, images and they will, won't have any uh, artifacts from compression or uh, JPEG compression. They, you can think that they return BMP images with no compression, but some of them, uh, cheaper or older, older cameras may have uh, issues with the image quality in general. And the, if the quality will be low, it can create some artifacts, but not from compression. Those newer, like this one, uh, is uh, artifact free and also no comp no compression problems even out even when shooting 60 frames per second. Okay, thanks. I, I just wanted to bring it up because I know I had started off with imaging with planetary imaging, and I got one of the uh, Celestron Next image, essentially glorified webcam uh, for for shooting, and it the software that comes with it, the, the capture does does introduce these these artifacts. So for people who are starting out and getting kind of lower end um, equipment, it, it can be an issue in in image quality. Um, there are that would ways be me from the other day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there there are ways around it. Um, uh, some of them, for instance, if you can get kind of a, a hack to uh, to capture raw images, even with something that has compression uh, built in. So I, I don't know if we want to talk about that at all to, to get things to more of a beginner level or um, stay at uh, more of a higher end here. So well, I know. Go ahead, Stuart. OK, just with my imaging source camera, um, I use the IC capture. I actually wasn't aware of the other programs that Peter uses. And um, mine pretty much worked out of the box. Uh, uh, in terms of just turning it on and just set, setting a frame rate and setting a shutter speed and setting a gain and and whatnot and the um, I had to do some minor things um, in terms of the Bayer matrix which I won't get into right now but uh, you can go straight you know take a color image with it and I really haven't had a a problem with with any artifactual problems with it. And the, the the camera, I mean, it depends on other people's idea of what's not expensive and what's expensive are, are different. I mean, this particular camera, I think, is about runs about three hundred bucks or something like that. The imaging source camera, you know, it's it's various various places you can find it, um, but you know, it's not not horrifically horrifically expensive, and it's designed from planetary imaging. Okay, My guess is that. My DSLR camera actually captured it. Uh, it's compressed to video. It used H264 uh, compression method, okay, and uh, uh, save it in um, uh, the extension move move uh, file. 
So it's compressed video. It's not uh, saved the raw video. But uh, uh, since it says uh, it can capture 60 uh, frame per second, so you can uh, take in uh, a lot of uh, frames. Uh, you can get some advantage with this. Uh, but you cannot uh, take raw image, uh, raw video uh, with with the camera for now. Yeah, I've had to take the the when I did uh, web streaming off my DSLR, I've had to convert it from MOV to AVI using what's the name of the program, Panzer or something like that, and that seemed to that seemed to work for uh, Registax. Yes, it works. I, I use virtual dub for to. Uh, that's it. That's extract, what I use. Yeah, extract yeah, the it. image. Yes. That's it. So we have a, a, a question here from uh, Paul Stewart, one of our guys at the solar imaging uh, at, on the southern hemisphere. Of uh, what's your best method for actual focusing? Because it, again, you're essentially turning your telescope into a, a lens, a big, huge lens for your camera. Is there any techniques that you guys use that helps a lot with your focusing? Bastinov mask. I'm using Bastinov mask. Yeah. yeah for more, the sun can be a problem. Okay. The object yes. is very big. <laughs> yeah, you can't use a Bastinov mask on the sun. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you need a point. You need a point right. target for that. But the uh, the sun, you just sort of have to eyeball it. And I found the sun to be ex extremely tricky because um, there's the effect of limb darkening. The, the sun is brightest at the center, and as you head away to the edge, uh, it falls off by about intensity by about half. And so if you can get the, the edge of the sun in the picture and you have a really clear, good transparency day, you can get the edge in pretty well. Um, for the Venus transit, it was nice and easy because, okay, now there's this nice round dot to, to focus on. Um, and even sunspots may not have very high contrast. So um, it's definitely have some live view software where you can play with the focus as you're looking at the image that's coming in. And you know, some of it's just eyeballing it. You won't be able to use like a, a point spread function like you can with stars um, or you know looking at a, a full width half maximum like you can for stars. So it, it takes a little bit of a uh, of a just eyeballing it to see okay when do I get the, the sharpest image and of course you're also you know dealing with seeing when you're doing this so it's it's having a lot of patience looking over time and saying okay that's the crispest the sunspot has looked or that's the crispest this limb of the, the sun has looked um, and just going slowly with a live image and taking into account that seeing will affect it as you go yeah. and I think the other thing too is to get the right exposure settings so like as you're climbing that learning curve you gotta find the right exposure settings and look for a high contrast area, like you said, the edge of a planet or the edge of the sun or something that has a, a kind of nice light and dark area to it. And you'll know when it's out of focus and you'll know when it's bad seeing over time. When you play with the focus and you go in and out, you go, okay, this isn't getting any sharper or this is as good as it gets because sometimes maybe that's all you get to that night. And on a good night when, or a day, whatever you're observing, you'll you'll be able to tell when it's in focus because it'll it'll it'll, it'll tweak the knob and you go, oh wow, there it is, and all the detail just pops up right on a live display. And the live display is important for that. I mean, that's one of the only ways to do it. And it's just kind of this. Uh, it's like riding a bike. You know, once you once you figure out how to how hard to twist the knob, because sometimes you hit it too hard and the image jumps all over the screen. So you really just got to kind of figure it out and you kind of go, okay, this is you know this is about right here, and then. You, I don't touch it again, but check it. Do check it every once in a while, um, because some, sometimes as the night air cools, it will knock your optics a little bit too. I don't know about the the rest of you, but as far as between um, deep sky imaging, planetary imaging, solar imaging, I've, I've found solar imaging to be the the most challenging, uh, just because you don't have these neat points of light and and uh, to to focus in on. So. I find it hard enough just because it's hot sweating out. Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> Got so a good is the worst thing for the sun vision. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the sun is hot. That's that's for sure. But 
No, Scott. You know, so, yeah, go ahead, Sue. I just wanted to show my um, my flip mirror, what a flip mirror looks like. Yeah. Uh, so this is let's get in the frame here. So this is a flip mirror. Um, the you you stick the telescope here. You have an eyepiece up here, and you put your camera here. And what you do is you turn this knob, and this knob will create a a a mirror right there and that will frame it, that will stick, shoot the light up this way and then I use a framing eyepiece like this one which has a um, has a little square in it that will, I get the planet or whatever I'm trying to frame right in the middle of the view and then once it's right in the middle then you flip this down like that and it goes into the camera and it saves hours of time, especially at high magnification, trying to find, because getting a planet in a tiny little sensor um, is way harder than you think it is. Yes. It's and even when you think you got it, if your exposures are off, you still can't see it. No, so. you still can't see it. So <laughs> right. the, the flip it's mirror good. has, you know, and it's, you know it, it, it was the best investment I've ever made in terms of planetary yeah. imaging. Yeah, yeah I this one sounds like a shooting. Bucks. I was going to say, I spent a couple extra bucks and I got a um, filter wheel that one of the positions is taken up by a, a tiny little mirror diagonal that has a little eyepiece holder on the top. So I kind of have like an all in one. But yeah, e either way, e it is helpful to have that. The other thing you got to do is you got to constantly swap the eyepiece out for the camera. And every time you do that, you're going to change the camera orientation and you're also potentially going to lose focus. So, so that has a, a, a kind of a frustrating end to it too. Whereas this, you don't you don't have to touch that. The focus will stay in. The camera will stay in the same orientation, and you don't have to worry about you know learning. Oh wait, did it go in this way last time? Because now when you make corrections to your map, it's going to drift in and out too. I've never used one of the flip mirrors, but I, I'm guessing there's a way to position the eyepiece so that you still have focus for the camera and still have focus for the visual view, correct? Uh, well, sort of. It's um, the, 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 the eyepiece and the camera don't, aren't necessarily par focal, um, okay. but w all you're, you're not trying to get focus in the, you know, in the eyepiece. You're just trying to get it in the middle of your little square, right in the middle of your eyepiece. And if it's right in the middle of your eyepiece, then you can concentrate on focusing it using, you know, whatever method you're using. You know, um, like Peter and I use the Botanoff mask. Um, and uh, so that, that's how I do it. So, I, you know, I hope this explains a little bit more on, there's a lot of setup that goes on when you're trying to actually get, you just don't hook it up, take a look at the sky and take a picture of Mars, even though it's the closest thing really to us. But there is a lot of setup, there's a lot of making sure everything's focused, making sure that your software's working right, you got right, um, your ISO settings, your aperture's correct, everything like that. But even with that, there's a whole lot more of getting this beautiful image, which we go into actually preparing this ABI output file. And I believe Ahmed was going to go in a little bit of how to prepare this ABI file for actually to get to the processing, so the, the pre-stack before the processing goes. Yes. Uh, let me screen share. Uh, you know, if you are capture your uh, video in raw format, in AV format, you can uh, directly use it uh, into the uh, stacking program, or like auto stacker or uh, Registax. Uh, but sometimes you need to uh, you need to uh, convert your AV into some you know, files, maybe into uh, uh, extract frames into BMP files. Okay. Uh, I generally use with virtual dub for use for for this. Uh, let me show you. Just open a video. Here, let's choose the Jupiter. 
And in the file menu, you, there's an export and image sequence here. And you can select which uh, format you are going to export. There's Windows, PMP, TAR, G, GPEG, PNG. So we choose the uh, BMP because it's uncompressed. So you give the file name, like Jupyter, Jupyter 0, 2, 4, let's say. And uh, directory, which where it's going to extract. Let's put it here. OK. And press OK. It's extract the uh, uh, frames uh, from the video into the uh, folder you choose. So let's get. Yeah, the frame is here. Okay. So uh, actually, I should uh, put them into an uh, empty folder. <laughs> so let's create a folder and move them there. And now you extracted your uh, your frames here. There's a uh, 635 items here. So now you can uh, use this uh, this image uh, directly uh, to the uh, your static stacking program, or uh, you can also uh, split. You know, it's a color. Uh, color image, you can split uh, it into uh, RGB channel, mono channel, so you, you can uh, process each channel independently and then uh, combine them into uh, some program like uh, Astra image or Pinjupos. Okay. Uh, sometimes I use this method because uh, the outcome uh, become better with uh, RGB processing. Uh, so it depends on your choice, uh, but you know it's it requires three times uh, uh, long uh, because you process R channel, B channel, G channel separately. And there is also another program let me show you the uh, castrator, right? <laughs> yes, it has a funky name to it, but... <laughs> castrator. <laughs> let me find it. Okay. Uh, this program also used to uh, center the uh, image uh, and uh, crop the uh, black uh, black sides, so uh, it will reduce the uh, file uh, size, and also it uh, helps the, the uh, stacking program to process faster because it's, it's uh, already uh, centered, al aligned. Okay, so the process uh, become faster. I think. Uh well, by the way, on, on the topic of centering and cropping, if you uh, if you want an advanced tip that I got recently, most of acquisition programs have a, a region of interest. Usually, it's called ROI um, on one of the tabs or one of the options there somewhere. You can use ROI to automatically restrict the, the field of view. So, like uh, Saturn is notorious for having a long rings this way and a lot of black space on the top and the bottom, so you can actually decrease that. So that'll save your disk space right out of the gate. You can capture also at higher frame rates. 
Mm. And that's mm. something that saves you from having to crop later if you ROI during your acquisition. That's a mouthful. Mm. Something to play with. Yeah. Peter, does the imaging source have that? Uh, you can use the ROI uh, uh, to get a small frame rate. It's just a small frame, but it won't go faster. Uh, they they, uh, do, they yeah. don't go faster in small frames. Uh, pond grid cameras can do it. If, uh, if you have a pond grid camera, if you get a small frame, it will go faster. Mm -hmm. Not every brand supports faster frame rate on small frames. Okay. Also, to, to jump back a little bit, because we were talking about processing different channels, um, Peter, since you're using the, the color wheel to shoot through, uh, how long will you record for each color channel? Uh, mainly asking because you have objects like Jupiter where you can detect a noticeable difference in, in the uh, position of spots and, and features in the bands over something as small as like three or four minutes. So if you were collecting data on three different channels, I mean, how long um, will you shoot for for each particular channel? If you don't, if you want simple, for simple solution, you, I can say total three minutes to capture everything to get a nice, not uh, blue-red image by, by the planet motion. But there are applications in Jupos that can uh, the rotate the planet for every channel. It will fix uh, the, plan the planetary rotation and allow you to shoot for even 10 minutes or as long as you, care, you want. Not very long, but uh, it allows a lot longer t time to capture. Uh, in my case, I usually capture 2,000 frames for red, green, and blue at 60 frames per second, which is fast, and then a four or fifth uh, AVI for luminance, which is uh, three or 4,000 uh, frames with a brighter uh, filter, uh, orange or uh, clear luminous filter. And then I process, this, uh, uh, when I'm making the color um, final image, I do it in Vinjupos which will uh, fix the planetary rotation between every uh, channel. That, that's high up the learning curve, uh, I think, too. But I, I've been playing around with that. It is a great program to do that kind of stuff. I think the answer is also it depends. It depends on uh, how big your telescope is and how, how well resolved some of the features are. So you can shoot for longer if the features are tiny and you, you get rotational blurring, you won't see it. But if you've got a real sharp, crisp view that's super huge, you're going to notice it a lot quicker. Uh, and if you go a little bit too far, you can just take the red and the blue frames, or depending upon what order you shoot it in, and you can kind of move them back toward the center. That's kind of a cheating way to do it. Um, you'll, you'll end up with edge blurring. You'll end up with a red limb on this side, the blue limb on that side all the white spots in Jupiter 1, though. So, but it really depends on how well resolved the features are in your scope. And I, I know there's not a, not a large group of us that are into astrophotography, which is actually what this is for. So can one of you explain what you're meaning about the, the, the luminance and the, the red GB, what that actually means when doing these photos? It's not just like having a point and shoot and getting yeah, an image. Okay. You're, you're doing a whole lot more involved, right? Well, it, it, you know, it's, and it's not just the, the color filter wheel, right? Even in a color camera, uh, what we're doing is we're taking a picture of something that we assume to be static and not, not moving, right? And it's, just, it's very much akin to using a camera on a tripod and taking a picture of the night sky or taking a picture of something that's dimly lit. You open the shutter on a bulb exposure and you can let the light soak into the camera film or into the CCD, and you're assuming that nothing moves. If somebody walks across your field of view, in that long duration exposure, you'll see that person appear as a big blurred spot. And so we're doing the same thing. You use a color camera and you open the, the shutter for three minutes, right? You take a lot of frames, but if you compare the first frame to the last frame, if the object has moved significantly, then it appears to blur a little bit from the first to the last. So if you took a half an hour long capture on something that rotates fast like Jupiter, it's going to look like a giant smear, like, like some Picasso painting or something like that. And, and you try to avoid that. And it's the same thing if you're using colored filters and a monochrome camera. You're, you're bound by how long you can take these pictures 
by how fast it moves. Right? If you have a kid that runs through your frame, even if it's a normal daytime exposure, and they're running too fast, they're going to streak across the, the, the film too, or, or the chip. So, so what we're what we're doing is is trying to get as much data as we can before the planet moves significantly, and there's ways to counter it. Uh, like Peter said, using wind jupos, which does this derotation. It's kind of an advanced topic. I think we could probably, in fact, I would like to see us actually cover that one. Maybe, maybe after we kind of bring bring the audience up to to the right level, because uh, that's right. actually a tricky program, but it's actually a really cool program for you to have a lot of options, even if you're just using it for a few months. It's a cool program. What program is that? Wind Jupos, W-I-N-J-U-P-O-S. Yeah, and I think I think Ahmed's got a list of links that Scott's going to push out to everybody. Yep, I'm going to be putting in right now. Yeah. But no, that's great. There is there's a whole lot to really think about. Again, it's not just taking a still. You're holding. You know, you're basically you're holding the, the camera. You're hoping it open for a long exposure, and anything that changes, you'll see it over time. And what you're trying to get at the very end is one image, but you're having to take and grab all this data, to try to find your your best out of all of it, and put it together as one large composite image, right? All right, that's a that's a good segue back to you, Ahmed. If you had uh, so you extracted the the files. You want to stack those? I have I have some really simple stacks. I don't I don't have any really good ones. I'm always disorganized with my data here. <laughs> but that that stacking we talk about it a lot, right? Whether it's done in Registax or whether it's done in AutoStack, or this, you know, we're we're amassing all of these frames that should look almost all exactly the same, and then we find the best ones. So the computer sorts through, finds the best. So like Peter said, he's got 2,000 frames for each channel, right? So if you took even even a color, you have 2,000 frames, and maybe you want to look for the best, I don't know, eight or 900 frames. So the computer sorts the finds the best ones, and then there'll be somebody that can explain it better than me. It averages all of the x y coordinates for all of those. So you know, so when you're looking at, let's say, the rings on Saturn or the polar caps on Mars. You know, they're all stacked on top of each other, and it smooths all the, the, the noise out of the chip, it, and it finds the, uh, the best quality frames, so you end up with a better looking, softer looking image of all of those subframes stacked together. I think that one of the terms is called lucky imaging, because you're, you're finding all of the good frames and getting rid of the bad ones. Just going back to the the question though of um, RGB and uh, and luminance, I guess typically for planets because right. they're they're bright enough that you one thing is is how you time each each one, and for planets you typically take the same length uh, exposure for red, green, and blue, correct? As opposed to the like, deep sky where you might do a longer blue than say uh, and, and shorter red. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, I think I think you'll find you know most people would do the same, right? The same sub time for each channel. So like 45 seconds for a red, 45 seconds for a green, 45 seconds for a blue, or you know whatever whatever your total target is divided by either three for the red, the green, and the blue, or four if you include illuminance. Uh, some people sub will substitute the luminance for an infrared. So there's you know there's different ways that you can do that. There's there's all sorts of different techniques. Uh, most of the work I do is just straight red, green, blue. I don't typically add a luminance channel for a lot of work. Sometimes I'll slip in an infrared, and, and I'll usually call it out. I usually try to label all my images fairly well, so you'll know what sleight of hand I'm pulling on using. <laughs> so you know, as, as Akma just showed that you know we're taking this ABI this ABI file, and we're trying to get you know, everything centered in, which is what he was using there, I believe, with uh, Castrator. But after that, so everything's centered in, you're going to be stacking this process. And I believe he's got um, auto stacker up. There's auto stacker. I just put up the link for it, and also Registax, which are free software. And Mitchell also, Mitchell Duke posted about um, Iris, which is, again, another piece of free software. So um, earlier in the comments, I did post some media fire links that Ahmed provided for us with some of his ABI files. So those of you watching right now can actually download those 
and stack these on your own to see what kind of an image that you can get while we're going through this. So it's a great opportunity that's free and gets more of a sense of how to end up with these beautiful images coming from a video file. Okay. So do you want to show us how to use AutoStacker real quick, Ahmed? Yes, I, I'm going to show how to how I use this AutoStack stacker. <laughs> uh, let's choose uh, maybe uh, Jupiter. Just uh, drag and drop here. Okay. In the right uh, right side, there's a window. We can uh, select the uh, size of the out output here. Okay. And uh, actually, first you should uh, select the, the left uh, panel. There's a uh, image stabilization uh, option, the surface or planet. Uh, you can also uh, use this uh, software for uh, sun or moon for surface uh, processing. But we are going to use uh, for planets now. So we choose the planet here, okay? And there's a quality estimator, the, the other options. There is a two options, H or gradient. Uh, H is uh, generally used in small uh, planets like Mercury or uh, Venus, Mars. It works well in, in these uh, planets. But the bigger uh, planets, like Saturn, Jupiter, we choose the gradient. And there is also some uh, uh, options here, noise robust options. This is, uh, I generally don't touch it, just uh, leave as it. Uh, but uh, if your uh, image quality is, uh, the scene quality is very good, so you can choose uh, lower value, and uh, but uh, I prefer to leave it. Uh, what is it? Okay. So uh, everything is ready. Just play, analyze. So while while yours does that, I I opened up the recording here too. Shift the focus over. I, the other thing I want to show you is, um, and I haven't tried this with AVIs. I, I record with .fit files, so I have uh, just piles and piles of uh, I'll show you some of these these uh, .fit files that get written out with my program, and uh, I end up sorting them into subfolders. And so the one thing that I like about AutoStacker is that you can grab multiple folders. Let's say a red, green, and a blue, and you see. Uh, here it says one recording open, but if I grab multiple folders, and that's kind of nice, you don't have to open the folders themselves. You can drag multiple folders, and now it says three recordings open. So I can take the red, the green, and the blue and stack them all at the same time, which is nice and, as well. Uh, and for me, you know, everybody's camera and, and settings are different. Um, I've noticed that usually if I just select single alignment point, which centers it on the planet, mine are already centered. But uh, they don't have to be. I, I've done it both ways. I select single in the alignment points after I drag and drop, and I usually just click stack. And then it outputs subfolders with all of my data in it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm only mentioning that because you have the options there in AutoStacker, but you don't have to use them. In most cases, I've found that uh, I, I end up with better quality frames by not touching any of the options and just leaving all the defaults and just selecting an alignment point of single and clicking basically clicking the go button and then I walk away and come back later. Um, Scott, does it does it align and stack at the same time? Auto stacker? Are you asking me? You're asking the uh, wrong person. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to ask Mike. Yeah, it, it does actually. Um, it, it, um, it, I think there's an option if you're doing surface, so for example if you're doing the moon or if you're doing the sun, uh, you have to anchor it. Uh, but it, the, the default is for planet center of gravity here, and even if the planet jumps around the frame a lot, it, it will find it for you. And, and, and I think you can bypass the analyze button if you just do a simple a single 
alignment point. If you want to do a multi-alignment point, which I've had mixed results on, the multi-alignment point uh, finds real cool areas of interest, like, say, edges of the rings of Saturn differently or different features on Jupiter. It will find each one of those and align them separately. But if you leave it for single, it's essentially just finding the, the center of the planet and, and using that as, as its center point. So it's, it'll center it for you on the fly without having to do um, any of the pre-work either through Nanox or, or Castrator or a different program. Um, you can just click the stack button on center gravity and it'll go. Uh, if you want it to do multi-alignment, like if you have really good data, then you would hit the analyze button first and it'll sort through all the frames before you have the option to, to, to do the multi-alignment point. Um, like I said, this, this program is a, is a great program with the defaults built in. And, and I love the fact that I can grab multiple um, multiple AVIs in my case and just drag and drop them in and then just click the go button so I'll walk away and come back later. So, so my last question on AutoStacker is if I start mucking with the defaults and I realize I don't like them, is there a <laughs> factory setting that I can go restore to defaults? Yes, uh, and I, I didn't realize <laughs> this until after I had been using this program for a little while. This is uh, Emil, I don't know how to say his last name, he's got too many vowels in it from my American tongue here. Uh, Emil put me in for the for the beta testing credits, which I don't remember doing much of, but there is an AVI file that it writes, and I think it writes it into the, it's not an installed program, it's a drag and drop out of the zip file and run it from wherever you put it kind of program. So if you write it to your desktop or stick it in a Windows program file directory, wherever you, you um, grab that file and double click it from, it writes a auto stacker, I think auto stacker 2.ini file and that ini file contains all of the things that you did to change the non-defaults. If you delete it or rename it, it all wipes back to factory, factory settings. So let me finish the blue and you see it looks a little sharper here than if you were paying attention before. I, I think you can see that, that edge over there. Let me move it a little bit here. Um, the blue is done and it's moved on to the green, so it's doing the green for me now. It's, it's at 33% complete. Um, so the blue channel is nice and, or the, uh, yeah, that's the blue channel. And it's on to the next one. So it's a really great program, just out of the box. It's so flexible and easy to use. And, and, it, uh, and I think Chris was playing with it the other night and he's, he's done a nice little side-by-side -side comparison of the Registack 6 version and the Auto Stackard version. And, you know, some of it's subjective, but you know, I think he and most other people prefer the auto stagger version. Right. You too, Ahmed? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I always <laughs> get uh, better uh, results with auto stackers. Yeah. But I, I use, prefer to choose multiple uh, aligned points. Mm -hmm. uh, Have you noticed the difference? Have you done a side by side comparison for it? I have a few uh, comparison. I think you, it seems to me uh, multiple. It's you uh, a little better image, but uh, maybe I should some uh, more tests. But it seems to me uh, it's uh, uh, better. It's a little better. Uh, the, the danger that I've always seen with, with using the multi-alignment, though, is that you end up with these uh, seams. So you, you, you have two, let's say, the great red spot and, and a moon or something on Jupiter. It'll align it on those separately and individually, and then it'll kind of stitch it together like a jigsaw puzzle. I've always, and maybe that's just the way that I do my sharpening, I've always seen that line show up later, and it always bothered me, and I always got frustrated by it. And so, so just so people know, if they do the multi-line point and you see these weird jigsaw puzzle looking things later, that's where those come from. So you can, you can go back to the single alignment and that'll get rid of those. Yeah, I, I also guess sometimes that... Right, right. It depends on how good your source quality is, right? So if one yes. area of the planet shifts more relative to the other, then mm -hmm. you'll see that ugly little seam later on. It's just something to pay attention to. Because you can do it either way, right? So may maybe start simple with a single align and then move to a multi align. Yeah, just try and error the method. Use. Okay, it yeah. sounds like we're reaching that threshold between science and art. And so trying to <laughs> to, to tweak things just way to get them in a, in a personal way. Because, I mean, as we can see here with Chris, you know, you have these side-by-side -side images of, of Saturn, which are they're both gorgeous. And they're both using... Um, so one's um, auto stacker and one's registax. So it's it's all 
you know, taking a look at different settings with a different program. And we'll actually go into Registax next, which is what I'm a little more familiar with than AutoStacker. But, no, it, it's definitely, there seems to be a lot of uh, personalization that goes on of what you're more comfortable with, with knowing how to use the setting, but also what your intended output really wants to be. Do you use a specific thing, Peter? For plans, I use Castrator and AutoStackers. I just open all the AVIs in Castrator and it will crop center the planet. Then I open all the AVIs in AutoStackers and it will stack all of them. I use the one alignment point, one frame for alignment in AutoStackers. And I get the stacks and I can, I can process them later. If I, I have a lunar or solar images, I usually put them into Registax 6 as it supports multiple AVI stacking in one run. So I open then batch mode all the a AVI and Registax will stack the every lunar AVI I'll give it to. So Peter, and you can't, you can't open multiple Registax AVIs? I'm sorry. I, I, I was asking, because I, I, I can drag and drop multiple recordings, because I, probably because I use a FIT file format. You're saying AutoStacker won't allow you to do that for your um, for your photos, huh? With an AVI? For AVI, I just open uh, them. I don't have to drop them okay. or anything. Right. So what, Ahmed, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what what program were you using to prepare it for AutoStacker? You mentioned another one. Castrator. Is is that what it uh, sounds like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What it, what does it do? Uh, yeah. It it, it, it and it also I turns it into a fit file. Maybe one one person. And the castrator is the initial program for the auto stacker. It centers the planet on the frame, and you can also shrink the frame to a small size. It's a pre-alignment application for uh, auto stacker or any other. You can you can open the pre-aligned file in the, in Registax too. Scott, can you put a link to that program? Yeah, I just linked you in the IM, and it's in the uh, comments. Okay. I'm on it, Stuart. I'm on it. Stuart, uh, well, I've, I've been using Registax almost solely for all my planetary, and I went to try to switch to AutoStacker, and I was having trouble with it being able to open my AVI files. It would not open any of them. Um, and Mike Phillips told me to download Castrator, and what I noticed also with Castrator is when you put the video file in there and center the planet, it will actually make the file a FITS file as well. And then I was able to open it with AutoStacker without any issues at all. And moving from Registax to AutoStacker, you don't get as much, it doesn't seem like you get as much control if you just run it as you do with Registax, but it does seem a little simpler especially going from Registax to AutoStacker, it seemed pretty simple for me. But then I had to process the image in Photoshop. I didn't get as much control. It didn't seem like in AutoStacker. I don't know if that's just me not knowing the software or you know, what, what the case may be. I think, I think it has some different bearing options and things like that as well that, that you might not get uh, out of the box. I was going to show you my, mine side by side here. Uh, this is a single raw frame right here on the left. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor. I don't think you can. So the left is a single raw frame of a blue Mars I took, and there's some nice clouds here and the polar cap. You can see in the live display, um, this is obviously one of the better quality frames, uh, and this is actually a stack that just got created now, and this is the raw stack uh, that came out of, on the right-hand side that came out of AutoStack 2, and I, I aligned it. it for whatever reason, always gets flipped when I use AutoStacker 2. I'm not sure why. Um, and then there's a the slightly sharpened one over the top of that one, so between the two there. There's a, there's a sharpening option. That, that's one of the things I turned on in AutoStacker, that it'll do a blended sharpen for me on the fly. 
So you get a nice glimpse of your data already enhanced, I guess, before you even put it into the next set. The so question going, sorry, um, question I guess for Ahmed going back to uh, using the multiple alignment point in AutoStacker, do you have an option for deselecting certain points? Because I know, for instance, in, in Registax or another alignment software I'll use, which is called AVI Stack 2. Um, yes. You, Okay. Yes, yes, you have. You can just right click on the uh, on the point. Just remove the uh, remove it. Just right click. Uh, but gosh, you're right. I never tried that. <laughs> let me show you. Yeah. Just I'm fooling around with it too. There, there's also, and I don't know if you showed this on, but there's there's different alignment sizes, right? And have you played around with? Larger alignment size, so like uh, 200, right, gives me basically just the planet, right? 100 gives me, you know, four large alignment points, and then if you get down to 25, you get very, very fine alignment points. I think it depends on what you're imaging yes. too, right? So for Saturn, you, you would want it on the rings and things like that. You know, on Mars, it, it, the features on Mars are so small, I couldn't see using all these. It tells you 79 alignment points, right? To me, to me, there was no payback for that. Because it takes a long time to compute 79 alignment points over 2,000 frames times red, green, and blue. So that's one of the reasons that steered me to use single. And you can delete them too, by the way. Don't want that one, don't want that one, don't want that one. That's actually kind of cool. Can that can you, can you, yeah, and you can place them too. Okay. So you can manually place them, or you can have it just placing a grid over top of the planet. That's yes. kind of cool. I never actually put Manual, it. So I want to pull up here, and that little bright spot there, and then some feature down at the bottom of that. Just left click where you want. Yeah, and if you let it click. play some, if you let the program play some, I, I played with that when I was using it, and I was able to remove one of the uh, alignment points as well if you mm. let the program do it. It had four larger alignment points, and I was able to remove one. Can you mix alignment sizes? Has anybody tried that? No, I, I didn't try messing with no, that. No, you can't. It looks like you can, yeah. So here's here's a, here's three 25s and then two 50s. And I'd assume at this point you can just click stack. The other thing, too, that's worth to mention here, because we're, we're, we're in a state now in between your, your, your raw captured data and the stacked version. And it's, uh, to me, this, this is one of the more important steps along the sharpening. Uh, I own... Uh, upsize my data. I use Ninox instead of Castrator. They're very similar in function. Um, and I, I don't know if in Castrator you could do this, but in Ninox you can you can upscale the raw data. So uh, upscaling takes them and you know doubles or triples them in size or whatever you, whatever you pick. I usually typically go two times larger. So this is this Mars that you're looking at here in, in AutoStacker is actually two times larger than how I captured it. And it's also already cropped, hence it's real tight to the edge here. Um, you can do those also, uh, now that's in between the analyze and stack frames here, but you can do them in AutoStacker too, so you can do what's called this drizzling function, which will make it one and a half times larger or three times larger. Um, I do that because it takes the little fine pieces of detail, and when it stacks it, it looks a little bit more detailed. And, it, and, and if it's too grainy, like it can be, you resize it back down later. So let's say you go 3x. You'll see a lot of times I'll post images that are 150, you know, 150 percent larger than how they were captured. So if I go to 3x, I resize it by half later, which gives me that kind of a little bit larger than life view. Some people don't like that, but to me it helps in, in getting some of the detail out that normally I wouldn't see with my eyes because I wasn't looking for it. Oh, no. Do I keep talking? <laughs> I saw a little air dialogue. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I was just saying real quick what I was doing. So, you know, right now you're processing Mars, correct? And it still has a little bit to go? Or is it my stacks are done. Oh. My, my stacks are done. I don't know about all minutes here. I mean, he was doing Jupiter. I was doing Mars. Mine is finished. Yours is finished. Okay. 
So can you open it side by side? Like pick pick one of the raws and open it and let's let's look at it next to the final okay. stack. And do you have the? I think that convolution f option is turned on, isn't it? Uh, sharpened images is that is the option there. It, it yes. will save both. Um. Oh. <laughs> Here. Uh, actually, we, uh, oh, yeah, right. well, we, you, we should mention. <laughs> yeah. Should mention this actually. Uh, you know, you shouldn't uh, stack all the frame you have. Uh, you should uh, select the best uh, frames. Uh, if you have a good scene, and the uh, graphic will be uh, very uh, rough, uh, straight line. And then uh, you can uh, stack, uh, let's say, um, 50, 60 percent. Uh, it depends on your uh, frames quality. Uh, and then you can get better results. But uh, if you stack all the image you have, so the, uh, you know, the, uh, the worst and better image, all, all, all the image, the, uh, will use to uh, create the final image, so uh, it uh, the results will will be worse uh, because of the uh, worst frames. Yeah. So you should uh, uh, you should remove them. Yeah. Just uh, select the best uh, frames. That's another thing. There's a couple things actually to point out, right? And that is when you're doing the multi-alignment point, you, you have a, a, a single um, option, either either the total number of frames um, here, which is the green one, or a percentage, and you, you, you pick either one. But if you're doing a, a single alignment point, you can write different percentages and different file numbers out if, if you have that many files available. If this was 500, obviously, it wouldn't write 1,000 and 19. 50 here. Um, but if you're doing a single alignment, you have multiple options to write out. And, I, and the, the guidance I'll give as to the number of frames to stacks depends upon the seeing and how many frames you captured and the gain settings. And that's a mouthful to, to, to work with. So if your seeing was good, you can stack as many frames as you want, right? If the seeing wasn't super great, you'll probably want to stack enough frames to remove the noise that you get from the game. So if you have, let's say, 2,000 frames recorded, and it was kind of average scene, and your gain was really high, you might want to stack 1,000 frames, stack half of it. If your gain was set really low, then you can get away with stacking less frames. You might stack just a few hundred. So you've got to find your sweet spot for how many frames you can record comfortably based on what we were talking about before as far as the planet rotation. So that'll dictate how many frames you can get. Uh, and then your gain settings will dictate how many frames you really need to stack. Uh, typically, I stack between 500 and 1,000. Um, I usually don't go more than 2,000. It's just, to me, you're, you're running the risk of getting bad frames in there, and I don't get any payback. Uh, so you. You do what I have here, and you write 400, 1,000, and 1,950 um, stacks out. So you end up with three saved files. Each one has a different number of frames stacked, and you compare them. Then you get a good sense for how many you need to stack based on the seeing and, and the graininess of the image that's resulting from how, you know, how, how high your gain was. Do you, ever, do you ever use your registration graph to try to figure out like your quality graph there to see you know, where your cutoff's going to be? Yeah, I have, especially, especially in my Registax days. Yeah, you'll, you'll see, and, and Registax is good, very good at, at allowing you to grab that threshold because sometimes you'll see that real sharp hockey stick where all the bad frames are stuck at the end and it just shoots up, you know, or, or that, I forget which direction it goes up or down, and you're like, okay, I don't want those. You could, it's visibly noticeable that there was some real bad turbulence that hit in the middle of your capture for just a brief a moment of time. And you go, okay, let's ignore those, and you kind of sweep those under the rug, right? Um, I haven't really used that option super, super much in AutoStacker, if only because I used Ninox to groom my data a little beforehand. And that is one of the advantages of, of using like a program like uh, Castrator or Ninox is that it'll sort them for you automatically. 
And so you can kind of go, okay, I want the you know the top 2,000 of these 4,000 that I recorded, and those are the only ones that go into the stacking program like AutoStacker to Registax. And so you know, I typically don't have to even see that. So I see, you know, when I'm at SAW, I see a nice kind of flat graph here, and you see it kind of tails off a little towards the end on my uh, right hand side here. So yeah, you gotta you gotta play around with it. Those so the the three things in summary. If anybody's taking good notes, it's how good your seeing was dictates how many frames you stack and how much how much noise you have in your data, and it depends on your camera really specifically for that. So I'm going to have a, a Chris hop in here too. So we've seen Auto Stacker, and he's pulling up Registack six, and I believe you got the updates. Actually, no, it's just six point one. So Auto Stacker is one program that can be used for, for stacking these images that that come from an ABI files. You might use Castrator to center everything in and split them up, but Registack will also work with an ABI as well. So you're going to take this video that was captured and allowed to go through its own alignment process and to be stacked and using different things. So, um, yeah, I, what do you mean pulling up Saturn? Yes, this is the Saturn that I showed the photograph of earlier. Uh, this is oh, pretty great. much the best one and the only one that I have. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of going <laughs> with, yeah, this is kind of going with the workflow that uh, Stuart had kind of helped me with here. So, you know, Stuart, if you if you see anything that I need to do different, go ahead and jump in. Uh, basically, okay. you know, when you open RegStacks, you have to select the file that you want. Um, and I do all my files in AVI. Um, once I do that, you bring the pre-filter up and Stuart said something about the debayer method. I'm not real sure what that is. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll only do that if you if you if you didn't shoot, if you turned it off in your on your camera. You didn't, so I wouldn't bother with that. Okay. That's just okay. that's just. I what I, I did when I did it yeah. just to be safe. <laughs> uh, no, so, you, you don't need yeah. to. Uh, and you know, and then then we went over and just set the align points up. It automatically does align points. So, hey, I'm pretty sure you can set manual align points with this too as well, can't you? Uh, yeah, I think you just click yeah. left, left click on whatever you want. Yeah, you just, and then I think you can also remove those as well just by right clicking. It's the same as auto stacker. Mm. Right. And usually when I go through this, um, you know, I believe uh, part of that he said to bring up the registration graph. I tried that. It actually didn't even bring anything up for me. <laughs> it was you, you, have to, you have to you have to you have to align it first. Okay, okay, and and then you know basically just start the align process and and it goes through on its own. Um, does take a little while, I think. It, so, it seems so to take longer with Registax than it does with other stuff. When your align process is done, you'll be able to bring up your registration graph. Okay. Well, for the real nerds in the room, the reason it takes longer in Registax is that. The, the algorithms, let's call them, are done from disk in Registax, and Emil reads all the files into RAM and works with the files in RAM, so it tends to be a lot faster in AutoStacker for that reason alone. And also, by the way, if you, if you look here, I've, I've got, uh, this is the blue channel on Mars, and the, the left one here is a stack of 400, and the right one is a stack of 1,000, and I can't tell the difference between them. Now that's one of the reasons I don't tweak around with the options a whole lot in in Auto Stack. It is for the most for the most part, it does a good job. Just click and go. Um, so you know, maybe I should be using the 400 just in case there's something in there that you don't see until later. Sometimes it's good to have those files around anyways, just because some things might see, you might see noise more so in the a smaller stack, a smaller stack being something where you stack less frames. So the, the one on the left is, is 400, and when I sharpen it, I might see a lot more noise than if I sharpen the, the, the stack of 1,000 because it's smoothed out more. I've, I've spread that noise around a, 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 larger, um, a larger amount of frames. This is kind of larger law of large numbers, I guess, right? Right. 
with, you know, with the, the good uh, thing to remember too is that Registax as well. Sorry, Scott, didn't mean to walk on me there. Uh, he was talking uh, about uh, using your best frames and all that. You can do that in Registax as well, right in right, right in the bottom of the thing here. You can do percentage or you can pick the number of frames. I always you go with the percentage. Um, I don't know that there's a huge difference. Uh, I'm not sure there is, but I I try to use everything I can get. Yeah. Well, a good thing to remember too, when you're processing, it it does definitely depend on the power of your processor. You know, I've got a quad core that's overclocked in i5 right now, so it, his took around two minutes, and I think. How many frames did, were you processing, Chris? Uh, that was 2,001 in, uh, one frames, and it's going okay. to stack 1,700 out of those okay. 2,000. Yeah, go, go back and to the registration graph there, because you see, you see where that, that blue line is. That's the cut line. So from the left, reading to the right, it's nice and flat. And then as, he, uh, as, you, as you drag that slider off to the right, you're selecting the number of frames to stack. And that last little bit where it rises real sharp there, those are all bad, rookie frames that you don't want. I will right, say this so too for those for those that are lost or you know maybe your head's swimming a little bit. Uh, if those of you who have heard the name Damian Peach know that he's like probably in the top tier of, of planetary imagers in the world, and and he will attest to the the most amount of impact you can have on your final image is as you're recording. In other words, it's it's those three fundamentals of seeing, focus, and collimation. No amount of sharpening will overcome bad seeing, right? So. Right. So if you record good data, you get good data on the other end without having to do a whole lot. So I, I tend to not really tweak around with this stuff too, too much, right? I mean, you, you get what you get when you press the record button. There's very little that can be done after the fact. There are some things that you can do. Don't get me wrong. But the, the, the most amount of influence you have on the final result is when you acquire the data. So and, and these are quick, necessary steps you have to do anyways. Can you go over what uh, what you mean by collimation and actual seeing? You know, seeing is something that we can attribute to just our vision, but right. in yeah. in astronomy terms, seeing is something completely different. And yes. also, the collimation of your telescope is something different as well. Yeah, and I, so I wrote a quick little article about it that I'll probably share with you, Scott, and you can you can post that one later. I'll post it to my feed as well. But um, to me, those are the three big things, and I think seeing comes down to to the biggest influence over your planetary data. When you're shooting planets, you're shooting them from really, really far away, and so you're looking at a very tiny, you know, very few minutes of arc, right? Jupiter, the biggest planet, doesn't even get to a full minute of arc, right? It, it remains as, as, what, 40, 50 seconds of arc at, at its best? So it's very, very tiny, it's very, very small, which makes it susceptible to wind patterns in the upper atmosphere, uh, low surface level winds, uh, just atmospheric turbulence, the kind that you feel when you're riding an airplane and you're bumping around a lot, those uh, tend to distort your views uh, of the planet, usually very significantly and very visibly so. So when you look at an image, the final image is, is crisp and static and it's not moving, but when you look at the live view, it's jumping all over the place. So seeing varies from night overnight, depending upon the weather, depending upon the time of night that you're doing these th things at, depending upon the temperature of your telescope. So there's a lot that makes up seeing, and so understanding weather patterns, you know, I'm part meteorologist by nature of being a planetary imager. I, I tend to look at, and Mitch Duke can, can attest, we look at all the, you know, the relative lift, you know, the relative lift index is the, the, the thunderstorm indicator, so sometimes the wind goes up, sometimes the jet stream cuts across, sometimes the surface winds cut across, so you, you understand all these things, high pressure system, you know, all, all, the, all those, uh, the temperature drops over the course of the night, those all impact this, this, this loose term of seeing, right? Um, so that's that's by far and above the most fundamental thing that you have to realize. The first time out, when you're imaging, you, you don't really understand that. And then you see, you know, good seeing, and you're like, wow, look at this, right? And then you see bad seeing, you're like, I'm not pressing the record button tonight, and you just pack it up and you go ahead and read a book. Um, and, you know, there's, I'm sorry, there's a difference between seeing and transparency, too. So right. um, seeing is how... how how your resolution is when you're, say, looking at um, Saturn or Jupiter or the moon or whatever. Um, transparency is basically how dark it is and so how, how much light is getting through. So transparency is something you're interested in if you're doing deep sky imaging um, and interesting and doing really faint objects. Seeing 
you're not so much interested in transparency with planets because they're bright, but you really want good, stable air. Right. So you know what you know what I think is important too is is, is being able to recognize and, and, and in some part judge the scene. I think that's important because then you get a you get a real good feeling for what you can and can't do with your telescope, right? Right. Um, there's a good um, little comparison. So Pickering, I can't remember his name. He was one of the Lowell pros from the Mars observations in the 1800s. Pickering came up with a list of, of ten different values, and I think uh, Damien Peach did a pretty good job of, of actually demonstrating those using a star and an airy disk. And so you get a good sense for okay, what is you know what is that thing? And, and he, in fact, he's got some some uh, YouTube videos that you can see Jupiter that he's taken. This he's really good, uh, and you can see what bad thing looks like in comparison to what good thing looks like. And it'll give you a sense for you know, what you are experiencing, and you can judge that for yourself. And then once you understand what you know what the differences are, then you can understand uh, how to focus, right? Because focusing kind of comes after the scene. Um, collimation is important too. Collimation is essentially just the alignment of the mirrors. In most, uh, Stuart's one of the only people that doesn't really have to do this because he's got a refractor. But those of us that have compound telescopes, um, either a Schmidt has screen or some derivation of, of that, or like myself, who have a Tony, and you have two mirrors. You have one mirror that grabs all the light, and the other mirror kind of points it in the right direction or, or corrects it yet again. And those mirrors have to be aligned so that they're you know, either parallel or in the right, the Newtonian in the right orientation. So, so getting those on is also important. And if it's out just a little bit, you'll never get critical focus, even in perfect scene. So, so those, those are the my three rules are scene, collimation, and, and focus. And if you can nail all those, then you'll have really good source data to work with. Just in general, for, for people who are starting out, um, seeing, for instance, if you go outside and you look up and you see the stars are twinkling like mad, do not try a planetary imaging session. You will not get any good detail. As opposed to if you, if you go outside and you look and you see stars that are, are barely twinkling or, or not twinkling at all. And I know, like for instance, Scott, you're at uh, Mount Wilson, and that has some of the best seeing in the United States. That uh, There are times I've been observing up there, and from looking straight overhead down to about 45 degrees above the horizon, I've, I've seen it where the stars just don't visibly twinkle at all. Um, I'm in the LA basin and I've gotten nights like that as well. So um, so one way of, of just judging seeing even before setting up the telescope, get a look at the sky, get a look at the stars and uh, and see how, how steady the uh, the images are. To, to give some idea, we were talking about angles before and again more for beginners here. Um, so imagine that you have a, a U.S. quarter. I know not all of us are, are broadcasting from, from the U.S. here, but it's essentially about a, an inch in size, roughly. And you were to stand the length of a football, either American football or a, or a football for the rest of the world, field away. Um, that quarter from that distance away takes up about an arc minute of an angle. And so any planet you are imaging is going to be smaller than the size of a quarter from the distance of one football field away. Um, so we're, we're talking very tiny. And the thing is, we're not even just looking for the quarter. We're looking for details in the coin itself. Uh, how would the, the, the imprint of the letters or whatever else look? So you're talking even smaller than the size of an inch inch, two and a half centimeter size coin from roughly 100 meters um, away. Now imagine that you're trying to do this and you're doing it like say over a hot grill and so you would see wavy lines coming up from if you're looking if you say you're doing barbecuing or grilling you would look over the grill you'd see these wavy lines coming up that's bad seeing and so that's going to wipe out any, any image you have that's going to distort what your image looks like you know even from something a few feet in front of you or a few a meter or two in front of you let alone something that's a, a, a hundred meters away so uh, so seeing is very important to get that distortion out uh, uh, to having good seeing means you have less distortion going into your um, your observing or your imaging session as opposed to, to bad seeing where you're just not going to get anything of any use out of it. I was also wondering, I'm guessing that most of you probably don't even have um, some of your bad seeing AVIs versus good seeing AVIs, but it might be worthwhile just to give people a feel for what that looks like to kind of post and run a few seconds of a bad seeing AVI versus a, a good seeing AVI. 
I've got plenty That's of That's a great bad. I mean, who keeps the bad ones, really? Yeah. But I know some of you have them on your hard drive somewhere. I, I, I have one there. there. <laughs> <laughs> you have some, Stuart? Uh, yeah, I took... I, yeah, let me see if I can find it. All right. It's in the recycle bin, and you're just <laughs> bringing it back. <laughs> but but no, th thanks a lot for bringing that up. You know that that seeing to you know to the layperson means something completely different than looking up and seeing the sky turn to jello while you're tr you know, trying to look through it as it's wobbling around. It, it's something that's completely different. And you know we look up and oh the the stars are pretty. You know they're twinkling all over the place. But to an astrophotographer, you know we're cursing at it, telling it to go away. That we want to have still skies with fairly regular temperatures as well. So when it's heating up and cooling down, you're having that issue with wind, etc. The other thing that wasn't mentioned was also altitude. Um, you want a planet that's higher overhead, uh, closer to the zenith, because then you're going to be looking through less atmosphere. The less atmosphere you're looking through, the um, the less interference you'll you'll have from it. Now, of course, depending on your position on the planet, um, on Earth, that is not the planet you're trying to image. Um, the, that's gonna that's gonna vary. For instance. Um, you know, Jupiter right now is getting to higher and higher declinations, so for those of us in the, the U.S., it's going to be closer to overhead over the next coming years, as opposed to, say, something like Saturn, which is heading farther and farther south in declination. So for people in the southern hemisphere, it's getting better and better, but for those of us in the northern hemisphere, we're going to have to be shooting through more and more atmosphere to get, uh, to get shots of Saturn over the next, say, 10 to 15 years or so. Right, and so those photons that you're trying to catch in your detector are smashing into these these air particles. So that's what's causing this this poor seeing is that these tiny little things that we really don't know, you know, we don't see on a regular basis. We feel them because we get warm from the sun. It's smashing into these particles, which is causing what we observe at the end of the day, you know, turning to junk. And so we want to try to find the best way. That is, if it's up towards the zenith, you know, the top of the sky, and it being a really still, you know, having your air be really still is going to allow for your best see for imaging. Um, do you see my image now here? I see black. You see black. I mean, that is that is really bad, you know. That's a really <laughs> bad image you got there. Do, wait, wait, wait. wait. Do you, do you, <laughs> so you're not seeing my AVI here? I, I see the Windows Media Player icon at the top, and that's it. Go on to somebody else while I work on it. Okay. And, and Thad, do you think you can go into what uh, collimation of telescope is? So essentially, um, you want all of the, the rays of light coming to you want all the rays of light coming into to focus at the, the same position. So, you know, what you have when you're imaging, the chip is a plane. And so you want all the rays of light coming into focus everywhere on the same plane. If your mirrors are misaligned, you may be able to, you know, get focus at one part of it, but not over the, the rest of it. So, so one thing um, that you want to make sure of is that, yeah, all, all of the, the images coming to focus all in the, the, the same plane here. There are various eyepieces that you can use for collimation. There are various masks that you can put over the, the front of the telescope. Um, typically, you want to collimate on a bright star. Um, there are also laser collimators which are available so if you want to, to spend a little bit more for it so you, you put this um, in the telescope it sets up its own pattern within the telescope itself and then you'll use that uh, pattern for collimation that's by far going to be the most most accurate and easiest for for most people if you have more experience um, of course you can can do it off of a star so but, but the easiest ones will be these laser collimators where you know it will give you very specifically what the pattern should be. Now you're not dealing with things like seeing while you're trying to collimate. Um, everything is coming from within the optics itself and um, you just tr 
make uh, adjustments, there's typically adjustment screws on, say, a, uh, the secondary mirror on a Schmidt Cassegrain, or if you're using a Newtonian, uh, the the back of the tube where the mirror, the primary mirror is mounted, um, you'll you make adjustments there, and it's going to vary from from telescope to telescope, from from model to model. Uh, but the idea is to match the pattern that comes with the um, the collimation device. So, by, not that I'm giving anybody a plug, but I use the cat's eye collimation system for my Newtonian. Uh, that works pretty well. The downside of the Newtonian collimation is there's primary and secondary adjustments. Yeah. Um, but I went that route for a lot of reasons. Okay, do you see? Do you see my blob yet? <laughs> Your blob. I, yeah, there's a I blob. do. But uh, I think that the focus is going off of audio, so keep talking while you're showing your blob, and I'll stop talking. Okay, so this is my um, uh, this is my blob. This is horrible seeing from a few nights ago. Um, I know it's focused, but you can sort of see it going in and out there. Um, ignore the kind of black and white bearing pattern, but this is what horrible seeing looks like. And you know, I tried to do something with this, and I couldn't do anything with it. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to see there that with just something as poor seeing that even though you have a great telescope, which Stuart does, Stuart has a fantastic refractor, it's a great telescope, he has a great camera, but something as simple as the atmosphere not playing along, you really can't get anything done that day or night, depending on what you're imaging. Did, 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 did we, we ever finish Chris's... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, do we have a good seeing example also to, to give people a feel for what they should be looking for? Yeah, I yeah, might have look. one posted on YouTube here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Mike's got a great one of Jupiter. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> um, and did we ever finish Chris's uh, Registax workflow? Uh, Chris, you we're got quiet, the, so... We're not uh, very focused, are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's a good thing, though, because it's kind of... Uh, Froze up a second on me here, so I'm going a little. My computer's going a little slow on me, so. All right. Well, then we'll come back to you, Chris, real quick. Um, so there's my. That's my good. This is a good seeing example from a few years ago, and you can see the little dust motes kind of jumping around here. But uh, this is my eight-inch telescope, and it's probably two x upscaled. I'm not sure, and I think YouTube does some weird stuff to it. But you can see it's a little bit jumpy, and I'm sure it's not translating very well. You might just go watch the YouTube video. Um, in fact, I have a ton of tutorials that I need to post that are all in my other... I have a second YouTube channel that I use for like tutorials and seeing and stuff like that. But here, play it again. So this is good. This is good seeing Jupiter, and then I'll show you a bad seeing Saturn with the same telescope and the same camera. Yeah, this is my 8-inch. I call this excellent seeing. So one thing to notice with the, the good seeing is that, you know, if you look at the edges of the bands of Jupiter, there are features that are persistent from frame to frame, um, looking at the, the edges of the north and south equatorial bands on Jupiter. So the fact that it's not just, oh, yeah, there are, there's a north and south equatorial band, that you can actually see some of this finer detail, and it stays visible from frame to frame. That's, right. that's an indication that you have very steady air. I have another one here. Let's see. Oh, okay, this is a good one because this is the one I have the final red, green, blue on. And this is this is an original. This is a hundred percent size one here. And I mean, it, to me, it's well short, but to me, you can't. I I can't even see it move really. I mean, it's just so so subtle the movements on that. So here is the the final red, green, blue from that night was was this one here, which I thought came out pretty cool. Um, uh, actually, know, knowing that I know some new things now, this was done in Registax. This is 2000. This is 2010, November 14th, I think. This was the night where I was like, ah, the camera froze. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> it was just that good, and it was and by far and above. Uh, I think Mitchell's Duke was watching this as well. He'll he'll attest to this. By far and above, in many many years, the best scene that has ever happened in North Carolina, and it, it hasn't happened again since. <laughs> We're lucky you both mentioned if we could even see the stars around here lately. Um, but like I said, you know, this is just an eight inch and you know, when you get good good seeing you get good you get good results. But I think it's just really comes down to that in most cases. So I'll show you a bad seeing on Saturn. I, I purposefully wanted to show some good and some bad stuff here. So, uh, 
uh, average seeing here is bad seeing. Okay, so this is the same exact telescope that we were looking at Jupiter with, and this is bad seeing on Saturn. So as you can get sort of something to compare to here. That's about okay there. Now it's playing. <laughs> so it's you see it's 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 as good as focused as I could make it, but you could see it jumping. You could see it's almost as like someone was shaking the telescope. That's what it looks like when you have really bad scene. So on most nights, it's going to be somewhere in between where, where you'll see it sort of jump every once in a while, and then every once in a while it kind of stops and settles down, and then it goes back to kind of shaking a little bit. It's like dancing sometimes, and then every once in a while it gets a little tired and bored. And that's, that's when the seeing is good, and this is when the seeing is bad. And then I have an average one. Let's see. Uh, average seeing. These are done with my 14-inch, so kind of not too fair to compare. But that's a good average one. This is actually a, a screen share of my desktop's live view. I even zoomed in on the, the rings there. And you, so when you can see the Cassini division on Saturn, you have pretty good scene. You can see it kind of pop in and out. And this is just an average night, I thought. Because you every once in a while you'll see it kind of jump around a little bit. I like this video because Pink Floyd is playing in the background and I don't think you can hear <laughs> Always a good reason to love the video. Yes. You have to have well, good music while you're observing. <laughs> well, uh, Chris, did you said that you got everything back running again with your PC? Yeah, everything's good to go now. Um, and I kind of went ahead and did everything, but I can kind of walk back over what I what I did. Uh, the stacking process is all finished. Now you're into the wavelets, and that kind of, if I'm assuming correctly, sharpens the image. Uh, you know, as you adjust each each layer. Um, so basically, from again, this is a workflow that I'm using that uh, Stuart provided for me. Um, a lot of the work that, and you know, like I said, from the workflow, it, it, it hits spot on. Uh, a lot of the work is done in the uh, second and third layers. Um, and I adjust a little bit in the sixth and the first layer and got a little bit more out of the image. Um, you know, you just run your sliders back and forth. And, and basically, all I did was just kept playing with all of the sliders just to see what it would do um, until I was somewhat satisfied. And over to your right, you have contrast and brightness. Uh, and you also wait, have... Uh, can I, wait, can Chris, I just want to... What you said was very profound. And that is, a, all you have to do is you keep moving it around until it looks good. Yes. Because people think that there's some black magic to sharpening and uh, <laughs> this, it has to be done a certain way. No, it's, it's a highly subjective thing and it varies so much from camera to camera and, and optics to optics that there's no, hey, do it this way rule. You have to play around with it until it looks good to your eye, but it also has to look good for your camera settings and your optic settings and things like that. So, so, so what no you said was sacrifice. exactly it. There, no good for sacrifice. In those no good for sacrifice. No. Okay. no. Yeah, and, and you know, like I said, Stuart provided me with a great workflow, and uh, you know, Mitchell even posted a comment on here that uh, processing for each telescope and camera will be a little bit different. And, you know, he's right, but for the most part, Stuart uses, uh, as we said, a refractor and a completely different camera than what I use. I was able to actually, you know, use pretty much step by step the exact same steps he uses. And I get, you know, as you can see on the screen here, I get a really good image out of it. Now, this is just, you know, working at it a little bit. I don't know a whole lot about what I'm doing. Um, but this is the final product. I'm sure if I play with it a little bit more, I could get a lot better out of it. Um, but then I take it on into Photoshop Elements, and I'm able to sharpen it up. And I'll minimize this, and you can see it. I'm able to sharpen it up a lot more. So, you know, just using Registax and getting it close, I can then work it in with uh, Photoshop. And you can use GIMP as well, I'm sure, and help adjust the sharpness of the of the image. There's a there's actually a really good tutorial that Paul Hase, H-A-E-S-E, -E, did. Um, he's one of the Australian 
um, guys. There's a bunch of real good uh, guys in Australia that do planetary imaging. And his tutorial, he outlines probably at least four different sharpening techniques. And to me, you know, it, like, I, like you said, Chris, it, 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 you did some tweaking until it made it look good for you, right? And, and really, that's all it is. So, so he follows a rule of this technique and that technique and then this technique. So he did wavelets, then he did, you know, something in astro image, then he did a non-sharp masking in Photoshop, and then he did something else, right? So I have, I have my own routine and it works for me. You know, and I'm happy to, to dive down into it. We probably won't get to it today. We've been going for a pretty long time. But um, you, you, you can do a little bit in, in here and then a little bit later and it, and it will actually improve it for, you know, so you really, it's not just playing with sliders in, in Registax, it's playing with sliders in Registax and then putting it into another program and then doing more to it and you're like, okay, that's not good. And then you go back, so you, like, that's why I made a point to, to say, hey, you hit the nail on the head. You play with it until it looks good and sometimes it's in multiple different programs. And I'm, am I going to be correct in saying as well that uh, what I did for Saturn here in Registax, I may have to adjust right. differently for Jupiter or yes. you know Mars or something like that. So each right. one is going to be different, obviously. Yeah, but yeah it, di different planets are like driving different cars, right? You, you right. got to get the feel of where the mirrors are and where the, where the shifter is before you can really be successful. At it. But yeah, since I use a color camera, all I did to this image in Registax was basically just flipped it. And then you know I adjusted my my wavelets and then my contrast and brightness and then right. I threw it into Photoshop Elements and uh, you know sharpened it up quite a bit more and you can see yeah, looks good. if I switch it back and forth yeah. you can see the difference it brought out in that in that image. Oh, yeah. So definitely. Um, so they can also take images the same exact way night overnight of the same exact planet and get different results. Right. E even using the same, let's say you, because you can save your wavelet settings and I do recommend that you write your settings down or save your settings or something so that you can remember what you did later. <laughs> That's <Good idea>. <laughs> right? So write, write them down and save it and so I, I've, I've made it a point to do that and every time I change my 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 routine a little bit I, I give it a version number so I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd mm. that way. So I always know what programs I used and what order I used them in so that I can repeat it again later. Because what happens is, is you take the same place, so you take Saturn again tonight, if, you, if your weather's good, and you, you use the same settings, but it doesn't look the same, right? Mostly because the scene was different, or the planets changed orientation or brightness. So there's a lot, there's so many variables in this that you have to write it down. And, and if, you, if you write it down, you'll, you'll see the differences night over night, and that's when you get a real good eye for, for the seeing and what your telescope can and can't do. Right. Right. The, the, taking notes is important. You can either take notes, you know, just on a piece of paper mm -hmm. like Mike does, or if, like, you're saving files, sometimes I'll save files with names like, um, you know, FPS 30 per second, uh, uh, 1 over 60, um, gain, you know, 980 or whatever, you know, it, it just right. as a file name, and that's sort of my note on that particular file Speaking for that particular which. night. And here's a, you know, we were showing video for a uh, good scene. This is uh, the image that I just brought up with Red Stacks and Photoshop. It was probably the best scene that I've ever had. And this is the, uh, let me bring it up here, this is the actual video that I that I took that evening. Um, I've not had an image or a video of Saturn like this, I think, since I've been doing anything at all. You remember the good nights, wow. don't you? Yeah, that, I mean, it was it was good and steady. It was the night we had the impromptu star party with uh, Corey and Scott and myself. Um, it was just beautiful. And, you know, I can, I can compare that like Mike did and, you know, go to this horrible thing right here, and you know, I mean, I'm using. You're a brave man to show it, Chris. I know oh, that. Hey, you know, I, eh. but my thing is, though, you know, I've started. I'm a lot lower on the skill level than any of you guys are for the most part, and you know, I don't, I don't know anything of what I'm doing. I'm just trial by error here. You know, I, I'm working up to the level that you guys are at, and you know, it, it's it's hard to go through. But, you know, it's part of it. Like I said, I'm using a $20 webcam, so 
it's I think I'm doing pretty good bad. for a twenty dollar webcam. Yeah. So. And although, I mean, at this point, any of us have been using computers for quite a while, but it bears repeating. Any chance any program gives you to save something, do it. And in fact, <laughs> change change the name. Um, like, um, I guess, uh, let's see, Mike was talking about using different version numbers. You know, mm -hmm. add, a, add a number to the version every time you save it. This gives you points to go back to. So if you were playing and you said, oh, gosh, that looks awful, um, you know, then you can just go back and reload the the previous file, and and run with that instead. So yeah, I think the same holds true for when the seeing is bad too. Try anyways, because it's a good night to make mistakes. You don't like to make right. mistakes when the seeing is good, right? And I always hit the record button anyways, because you never know what's going to happen. Right. right. See, that's what I did. Nice to is, you know. is you know, with a with a Barlow, I don't have the flip mirror like Stuart does. Um, with a Barlow, it's it's hard for me to find with an eight inch. Uh, with the webcam hooked up to actually find Saturn. Once I do, I just hit the record button, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> and, you know, then I can compare. And this is one of the bad scene. And, I mean, you can see it, you know, waving around. Yeah, I focus probably wasn't the best, but this was just awful. You have to hit the record button, even just because you found it. Right, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> exactly. success in and of itself. No, serious. I, I, you know, I talk to some people and they're like, oh, you know, I said, hey, did you go out last night? Did you get any data? Yeah, I went out. I set up. I didn't take any data. Well, why not? Even if the scene was lousy, you, you got a record of what you did. You know, yeah. you learned something. You had fun with it. You could remember it, even if you just throw it away later. Who cares? You got a hard drive for space it. is cheap. Right. So, by the way, I, for, for logs, I use this program called Observation Manager here. It's an open source cross-platform little deal here, and it, it kind of gives you this uh, date time uh, you know, format for all your observations. So I record all my stuff in here. And, and I, well, once upon a time, I actually recorded all the settings I use, too, because one of the variables that you're going to play around with are the settings in your camera for exposure and uh, you know, the duration and all that sort of stuff. So it's important to take those notes as well. You want it to be repeatable when you know, when you know, you know the, the, the more you can do on automatic pilot by not thinking about it, the easier it is later on. So you go, oh, yeah, I know what settings to use because you've done it a thousand times before. There's a secret formula for success, and it's called experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this is a, a good place to actually end our session. We've been going on for a little over two hours now and had a bit of a feel on the different software, the different types of cameras, telescopes, and the fact that you're not going to get the same result every time. It doesn't hurt to go out, even when you think it's horrible conditions, because sometimes you can pull some great frames out. Um, I, I do want to thank, you know, Ahmed's wonderful. He, it was his idea to, you know, there's been a great uh, response to the virtual star parties and trying to get more of the behind the scenes magic of what's going on. So a, a, a huge um, thank you to Ahmed because this is, this is his baby and I think that we should have a little bit more uh, sessions like these where we can break them down to one focus because we this is a lot of information to take in. There's a lot of trial by fire and not mm -hmm. wanting to throw your camera out the window and smash it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this is a, a great starting point to get kind of an overview of all the amazing things that can be uh, th that can happen with just planetary imaging. This has nothing to do, well, a little bit to do with deep sky, but not, it's a completely different monster for us to take yeah. on. So I think this is a great starting point. Um, but again, you know, we have Ahmed here, we have Chris Ridgway, Mike Phillips, uh, Peter dropped out a little while ago, um, Stuart Foreman, and Thad Z is it Zabo? Zabo? Zabo is how my family was pronouncing Zabo? it. Yeah, yep. All right. So you pronounce okay. it Zabo, and as will I. Okay. But uh, I'm I'm Scott Lewis, and I want to thank you all for for showing up today. It was great to have all you guys with all your questions. Please feel free to keep asking you more, so we can get some more ideas for the next time you want to pull all the nerds out from the astronomy <laughs> stage and see what we can do for getting some images. Yeah, I, I, I would love to do more of these. This was fun. I mean, we, we didn't yeah. dive into sharpening, and you know, there's a lot of other tricks you can do with layers and stuff like that. So we will have a Mike, I want to see the baby. You want to see the baby? Oh yes. <laughs> Give me one minute, and I will bring the baby down here. Hang on.
Yeah. Mike is a dad 2.0 now. Um, God, while we're, we're, we're waiting for Mike's question. baby, let me. Um, I just wanted to say that planetary imaging is, I actually find to be a, a lot harder than deep sky imaging. Deep sky imaging is actually reasonably easy. You can just stick your DSLR on the back of your your, your um, scope and you know take a 60 second picture. But planetary imaging, as you can see, just takes a ton of work, and it's it's it. You know, you can, it's really easy to get frustrated, and don't get frustrated. I mean, that's why, you know, it, it Mike just, you know, Mike's been doing this for years, and I, you know, I've been doing it for about two years, and Chris just started, you know, a couple months ago with this, and you know, look how good he's gotten just in the last, you know, two weeks, you know, just by, just by talking to other people. Okay. So Mike? I was told I was told he was sleeping, and I shouldn't. Oh. Mess with him, which is always good advice. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think though, you know, just part of what you were saying there, I think um, we all kind of drive the pile forward, so to speak. So as far as us learning together, that, that helps everybody, right? And it helps helps me, you know, to, to explain it to other people because then I understand it. I go, wait a minute, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. think about that. It helps me to see how other people are doing it because maybe I wasn't doing it right and maybe there's other things out there that we can do. So, you know, the more, the more things are discussed and talked about it and... I think the easier it is, and it's to I me agree. it was always easier to show people than it was to, to try to write it down. So this this. And like well. Stuart said, with with me it's been two weeks. I think Stuart and I have been uh, corresponding back and forth about this, and um, I you know I didn't know anything really to speak of. I had a s small idea, but you know with the help of Stuart as well as you, Mike, uh, it's you know it's been so much easier for me to you know dive into it and, and get a better looking image. And it, you can't do that on a, I mean, you probably can do that on a forum, but I didn't find it as easy going through some of the forums that are out there. I found it easier, you know, one-on-one -on -one with Stuart or yourself to, you know, be able to sit down and actually talk through this. And it's yeah. helped me out tremendously. Without this group of people, I, I would have been where I'm at now. So, you it, know. It's such a complex topic. You sometimes don't even know where to start, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, no, I hadn't thought about that. Or, oh, geez, you know? So, yeah, no, I, I think it's a great idea if you guys can keep, um, keep writing down your ideas and different processes. Because I, I totally want to, to do more of these in the future so we can break down very specific subjects with, a, again, a little overview to lead us in. But I think having one topic in a session will definitely help us pull out details from images that we, that we might not know between ourselves and we can find something else out. So, again, thank you, everybody, that were able to come out here and all the, the questions and comments that are out there. We had a, a pretty good showing for, for getting the highly technical aspect of the virtual star party that we do and the imaging that we do and I at on the Google Plus stream. So uh, everyone right. have a great night or morning, depending on where in the world Bye you are. To you. And Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.